just okay hello everyone welcome back to parsha insights as we're looking through the cycle of parshiot of weekly torah portions uh, through the prism of the teachings of Rabbi Moshe Shapiro, uh, who we spoke a little bit about last time, and we'll, we'll, we'll deal more, more biographically in future sessions. But I want to jump right in now. Um, this week's parsha is Parshat Noach, as we talk about and as we speak about the uh, three periods, the three time periods that uh, connect Parshat Noach. And we welcome Rabbi Mark Fishman, uh, who is joining us? Here we go. Okay. Hello, everybody. There. Hi. There we go. Okay. So we're talking about the three time periods of Parshat uh, of Parshat Noach, what we call in very fancy uh, academic language that's used nowhere outside of Bible study. We call antediluvian, diluvian, and post-diluvian: before the flood, during the flood, and after the flood. So uh, uh, we are going to uh, we're going to teach two separate uh, two separate pieces, and uh, what I wanted to speak about was something after the flood, right after the flood. So we have what they call the Dor HaFlaga. I don't know a good translation of Dor HaFlaga, but it's uh, loosely translated as the generation of the rift, of the division, generation and that generation of separation. Generation of separation. That's the generation that uh, that tries to build the tower of the tower of Bavel. So here we go. We're starting So everyone on earth had the same language and the same words. So for those of us, you know, if we're looking at the story and trying to, to see you know, how recognizable is this world that they're encountering after the flood? Is it like our world? Is it like the world that existed before? So here is something, I don't know exactly about what existed before, but here is something in which that world is so disconnected from our world, is so dissimilar to, uh, to, to how we operate because they had one language. And by one language, this is not, not just a, a concept of linguistics. This isn't just a, you know, the fact that everyone spoke English, everyone spoke Hebrew, everyone spoke French, everyone spoke whatever it is. It's much more than that. It's that everyone spoke in a way that everyone could understand. There was complete comprehension from one person to another. I remember in, in, uh, in linguistics class at the university, we used to speak about the degree of, of comprehension that two individuals could have, and it's never gonna be 100%. Even between people who know each other intimately, even, the, even between spouses, when they talk to each other, there's always a small room for misunderstanding. Usually. <laughs> often is. <laughs> A small room for, for, for misunderstanding. There's, there's always something that doesn't get completely conveyed, and, and it's impossible. And how could it be? Language is such a, uh, it's, it's an extraordinary tool, but at the same time, it's a very poor tool of describing. We're much more, uh, uh, you know, or the way we learn, we, we learn much more visually. You know, if I want to tell you how my experience was, the best way is to show you a video of what the experience. If I want to say, I just visited a, a, a beautiful park. I could show you a video of the beautiful park, or I could try to describe it with language. And with language, I will always leave out details. If something imperfect about language, I won't be able to convey my experiences with their complete clarity and with their complete, with, with, with my vision, with what I have in mind, it can only be to a certain degree communicated with words. But in this generation of the rift, the entire earth had the same language and the same words. Everybody spoke the same. Everybody understood each other completely. They migrated. They came upon a valley in the land of Shinar. They settled there and they said to one another, They said to one another, Let us make bricks. In Hebrew, I mean, this is the, the paucity of the English language, that the verb for what you, you do when you create bricks is you make. The, Hebrew, the verb make is such a poor word. It describes such a, a, a broad spectrum of, of, uh, of actions. But in Hebrew, there's actually a specific verb for brick making. Let us brick make bricks. Let us, uh, it, it, there are many words like that 
in, uh, in, in Hebrew. I remember the first time I learned in Hebrew that there's a different Hebrew word for wearing a hat. The word to wear, to wear a hat is chovesh, chovesh kova, as opposed to lovesh, as opposed to wearing clothing, or even gorev garbaim. There are different words for wearing socks. In English, we just have one word. You wear a hat, you wear a shirt, you wear socks. But in Hebrew, there are different words, different verb for to wear in each of those things. So when it comes to creating objects as well, there's this, uh, there, there's something very beautiful about the verb uh, from making, uh, from making uh, bricks. Vini srefa l'srefa, and we'll burn them so that they become hardened. But he lahem halibena la'avon, they'll become as, as, as hard as stone. Ve'hachemar haya lahem lachomar, and the bitumen served them as mortar. So they're making, this is the process of making the, the raw materials for building whatever they're gonna build. Now, what are they gonna build? All they've co communicated is we need to build something. Now, what are they gonna build by Yomru? And they said, Hava nivne lanu ir, let us build a city, umigdal, and a tower, virosho vashamayim, and the head of the tower, the top of the tower is gonna be in the heavens, venase lanu shame, and we'll make a name for ourselves, pen nafut else we shall be scattered all over the world. We want to build this tower. This is the Tower of Babel. And of course, at this moment, this is the entirety of, of, of you know, act one of the story, which is they're making plans to build, uh, to build this tower. What happens next is that God says no. And that's basically the whole story. God says no and scatters them. We'll take a look at that in a moment. And that's, that's the whole story. It's not a complicated story. What is complicated is the big question is, yes, Peter, uh, I'm surprised that verse 3 uh, is before verse 4. Yes. Uh, there's no sense in making bricks if you don't know what you're making them for. And it's the verse 4 that says, let's build a city. And then obviously the way to do so is with bricks. Yeah, absolutely. You and the medieval commentators are on the same page. That it seems like they have, like they have, uh, you know, the, the, they have the, the action starts before they find a purpose. The purpose only happens once they've made the raw materials. Okay, now, now that we have these bricks, what do we do with it? Oh, I've got an idea. Let's build a tower. Um, it, it, yes, it does seem as if they're, it's a make work project that suddenly evolves into having this, this scattered purpose. I don't have a good explanation for you other than to applaud the observation and to say many others make this observation. And I think there could be a separate class in which we could go in that way and try to understand what, what was their objective in verse three, because you're right, it does seem uh, terribly out of order. Yeah, Esther. I was just thinking, it's true what you just said about the order of things, but if we teach kids or give them, give them the tools to play, mm. the tools come before the ideas come, like Lego, for example. You give them a box of Lego, they empty the whole thing out, and then they start building. So, yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Which comes and, and first, the chicken maybe, or the egg? Maybe connecting into our, our class last week about the, the elements of creation. You know, sometimes you just need the tools to play with and then see what, and then see what happens. But uh, and I think we'll, we'll get to this because I, I think what, what we'll talk about in the next few minutes is going to connect back to these ideas about purpose, about what what their purpose uh, ultimately ultimately was. And, and the Talmud notes this also, which is, you know, why are they doing this? What are they trying to achieve? And even the objectives that they state are not very, not very clear. Let's make a name for ourselves. You need a tower that goes to heaven to make, name, to make a name for yourself. There are lots of ways to make a name for yourself. So what, what, what exactly is, is happening uh, in, this, uh, in this verse? And the Talmud, uh, set, try, in, in trying to explain, yeah, please. If 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 I can interrupt um, to Peter's point, um, it's in the wrong reverse order. You're you're absolutely right. And what comes to my mind is that this is not a um, story that is happening. That on Tuesday morning they said, "Let's make bricks," and after they had finished the noon, they then decided that they were going to build a tower. I think what's being described here, and you have to take the timeline out of this, is the development of a technological society. One of the first created 
advancements in technology was the creation of bricks. And we take it for granted so deeply in our world today that it's hard to even imagine that there was a time when mud huts were built mm. differently. And I believe the point the Torah is making with the let us build a city and a tower and a name, even though we don't know what that is interpreted as yet, is that there is a direct correlation that here is the results of this particular generation of the Doha Flaga. They were blessed with technological advancement. And what did they do with that knowledge? They built a tower with its top in the sky. Mm. Now we are going to see, or Rabbi Shai is going to teach us, what that means and what the implications of a tower with its top in the sky. But without giving away the punchline, and I don't know what he's going to say because he has not shared with me his uh, punchline. You're making assumptions that I do know what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> you know what it sounds like to me? It sounds like our world and our contemporary society today. Look at the creation of the smartphone. Look at the creation of social media. There was even a quote of Mark Zuckerberg a couple of years ago who said, well, I didn't know that this was going to happen when I made Facebook. And I just wanted to connect people with each other. I didn't realize we we're going to have to be debating in Congress the ethics of policing people. Mm -hmm it just kind of evolved. And this is an incredibly contemporary story. I don't think there is a more contemporary one. We have created technology first, and then afterwards, it's been manipulated for its usage. Mm. And, and I find this to be as contemporary as tomorrow's newspapers in terms of how the social media giants are going to be quizzed in Congress as for the usage of the technology that came first. Beautiful, beautiful point. Thank you. So let's, uh, let's go jump into the, uh, into the Gemara. Uh, Tractate Sanhedrin, just a very brief piece, says the following, Nechleku, I'm a Rebbe Lazar. Nechleku le Gimel Kitot. They divided into three different factions. Achatomer, meaning the people who are building the tower, separate in terms of their purpose into three different groups. Achatomeret, one of them said, Nalev and Eshev Sham. Let's go and inhabit what Sham? What does Sham mean? There. There. And do we see another word connected to Sham? We're going to see. Shemayim. What's that, Peter? Shamayim. Shamayim, heaven, heaven. There is a deep connection between, and, and Peter, again, you're intuiting the interpretation, this time of Rabbi Moshe Shapiro, who's going to say something extraordinary about Sham and Shamayim. Let's go and dwell Sham there in Shamayim, in heaven. We're going to make our home in heaven. Let's go serve idolatry there. Let's go and let's wage war against, against God, presumably, against heaven. We're going to climb up there, and the front, the, the battlefield, is going to be in heaven. That's going to be where we're waging war, is all the way up there. So when the Talmud gives us three different opinions, it could just be interesting. Thank you, Talmud, for sharing three very interesting opinions. Or we could take it and say, what are these three trying to teach us? Why, how do they disagree with each other? What, what's the fundamental argument that they have that they had between each other? And this isn't three different rabbis offering three different opinions offered by one rabbi as to what different groups, different factions um, uh, said to one another. So it's very interesting to me also to see the, the concept of factions, because until now in, in the conversation and in the Torah, I think that they're working in unison. I think that there is a sense of unity because they speak one language and varima chadim and they say the same thing. And in comes the Talmud and says, actually, you might think that they all got along, but actually they had three different purposes in within the same group of people who were building 
one tower for three different reasons. And Rav Moshe Shapiro, I'm going to speak a little bit quicker because I want to be mindful of the time and, and also to, uh, to, to share this time with, with Rabbi Fishman and his teachings. But Rav Moshe Shapiro goes in a very interesting direction here. And the direction he chooses to move in, in, in one particular essay, uh, the direction is to, to say, what, what is this all about? What do we know about this story? What's the, what's the theme of the story of the Tower of Babel? And I'll tell you what the theme is. The theme is language. This is a story about the acquisition of language. This is a story about the diversity of language. This is a story about communication via language. This is a story about speech. You read this story, you think it's a story about a tower. No, this is a story about speech because at the beginning they have Safa Achat and at the end of the story when they're dispersed, they have many different languages, they can't understand each other. So something happens that's connected to the concept of speech. And listen to what he says, just in questioning the Talmud's three reasons. Rav Moshe Shapiro said, why would they want to ascend to the heavens and sit there? Is there no room on earth? According to the first reason, let's go up and live in heaven. What, what are we running out of? Were they sensitive to global warming that they needed to find another planet to live on? That was, that's not what was happening in time of, 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 of Migdal Babel, the Tower of Babel. No. What would sitting there add to their cause? Waging war with God, which is the third reason? That's equally incomprehensible. And to rise high to worship idols? What are you going to go up there to worship idols? It also seems in Congress. Is there a shortage of places to worship idols? Why do we need to go up to heaven to worship idols? It makes no sense. None of these explanations. Rosh Shapiro, in one quick, in one quick paragraph, cuts down each of these and says, is this a story about Helm, where they're doing these nonsensical actions? Or is there something much more fundamental to each of these uh, to each of these opinions, uh, to each of these um, to each of these factions in their in their approach? Um, to understand a, a little bit, just want to take a, a brief step back to last week's parasha and to an amazing Rabbeinu Bachia, a commentator uh, on last week's parasha, and he writes in the concept within the concept of how man is calling uh, the animals, how man is giving names to all the animals, right? And God formed out of the earth all the wild beasts, all the birds of the sky, and brought them to the human to see what he would call them. And whatever the human called each living creature, that would be its name. Okay, very simple. But the, the deeper question is what went into this action? What went into that? What, what thought process went into calling a snail a snail? Went into calling a monkey a monkey. Is it just the sounds? I mean, you know, there's certain language we understand. There's, you know, the onomatopoeia is something that we understand why something is called what it is. When something is called by the sound that it makes, that yeah, pop or or in Hebrew, one of my favorite, uh, you know, they're, they're classic. Uh, Hebrew is filled with onomatopoeic words, like the word bakbuk, right, which is a, a bottle. Does it make bak buk bak buk? It makes the sound of, of water coming out of a, the spigot of a of a bottle. One of my favorite Hebrew words is is the word for a snee for a sneeze. In Hebrew, the word to sneeze is lehitatesh, and therefore a sneeze, a noun, is a hitachut. A hitachut is a is a sneeze in Hebrew. There's so many words that are filled, and that makes sense to us. But why, for example, Rabbi Nebach is going to say. Why is a lion called an arye? Why is an eagle called a nesher? That's his, his comment. His why are these, it's a famous Rabbi Nubachia, as famous as, as these comments could go. And he says, uh, God paraded the various animals by means of this ability to characterize each creature. He demonstrated his superior wisdom, that he was a creature who had been created directly by God himself, meaning Adam had this higher level of, of knowledge. And in light of the Midrash, that the wisdom of Adam was reflected in the names. How so? We're just going to skim through and we'll send out um, uh, the link uh, to this. And if I, I can ask, uh, Maddie is on, on this call as well. Um, she'll post the, the link, uh, I hope, in, in, in the chat uh, at some point later in the class. And uh, everyone can have a link to this uh, to the source sheet and to read further 
uh, fully. So every single letter that Adam chose in naming these animals reflected a special meaning. And when the Midrash said about the uh, do, do this wisdom, Adam recognized the nature of the lion are yea. What's the nature of the lion? Because God himself is, is compared to the lion. As the verse in Hosea said, they will follow the Lord because he shouts like a lion. That means the lion must be very important. The letters are yea, which Adam selected when he named the lion, were chosen by him as all these letters represent spiritual values. The letter, the, the, the three of the four letters, Aleph, He, Yud, represents uh, the part of the name of God. And the letter Resh represents Ruach, the Holy Spirit. And so in Arye, you have God. You have God's essence. So it's teaching us something about the power of the Arye. A similar consideration, Nesher, and he goes on, I'm skipping around. Nesher, uh, the Shin represents the word Esh. The Resh represents Ruach. The nun represents the fact that it falls into the sea. And he quotes, I, I, I left this out of the, uh, it's just a very long piece. I left this out, but he co quoted there some type of tradition. They had this zoological understanding or biological understanding that the eagle would fall into the sea once every 10 years. It would lose all of its feathers, would fall, drop into the sea and come out of the sea with its feathers restored. That was, it was almost like, like a phoenix tradition. But uh, but connected to uh, but connected to to the nesher to the eagle that was part of the ancient understanding of how the nesher regenerated. So the eagle's name in Hebrew alludes to its role in history, its eventual demise, and that's what Adam is reported as having said. Not um, uh, not the word nae suitable. Basically, that Adam was giving using language to give to convey ideas to give form to that which would otherwise be incomprehensible, to make comprehensible something that otherwise would be incomprehensible. That's one of the functions of language is, and so look at what Rav Moshe Shapiro says, the defining quality of man is speech. His unique designation is middaber, a speaker. And speech contains three qualities. One, and this is what we were just looking at Rabbeinu Bachia, is speech, is the clothes in which we dress all existing realities. We give names and we render things comprehensible. That's it. With speech, even one who was not present at an event and who did not experience it has the ability to perceive it. That's number one. Speech gives a clothes in which we dress all existing realities. I wonder if Moshe Shapiro read Wittgenstein. Yeah, ex exactly. Uh, second, he may have read Wittgenstein. He may have. Uh, second, speech is the means of interaction, the way people connect to one another, of course. And he gives a few examples I've left out. And third, speech leads. And in fact, in Hebrew, the word dibur is connected, is actually a word of leadership. Yadber, in, in, in Psalm 47.4, Yadber amim tachtenu. Yad Ber comes from the word Dibor. So he said, these are the three, and you see where we're going here, right? If there are three reasons as to why, uh, why people built the Migdal Bavel, and speech has three functions, so what we're going to do now is assign each of these functions of speeches to each of the motivations that the people had to build the Tower of Bavel. The, I, I, the Aderet Eliyahu, the Vilna Gaon, said uh, what, what Peter said before, Hashamayim, when it says on, on the first verse, God created the heavens and the earth. So the Vilna Gon says, uh, that the word for heavens comes from the word Sham, there. Something that greets one from afar, basically, with one encounters from afar, sham, shamayim, there, there it is. Heaven is perpetually the opposite us. It's unattainable. It's always going to be there. That's the nature of shamayim, is that it's always at a distance. And we encounter it from, from afar, from sham. So shamayim is always sham. Shamayim is always there. And Rav Moshe Shapiro says the following, to connect the three the three to the three, the three uh, functions of speech to the three motivations of those who built the Tower of Babel. He wrote, the world was created so that people would advance toward a purpose. That was part of what we discussed last week in his teaching as well. 
since purpose by definition is not yet here, it can properly be called there. The end of all purposes, the all-encompassing sham there, to which all roads lead, is heaven. Heaven is the epitome of sham. That is the truest and simplest explanation of the verse, Bereshit bara Elohim et shamaim ve'et ha'aretz. And here he does something linguistically exciting and fun. He says, shamaim va'aretz. You think shamaim va'aretz means heaven and earth. No. Aretz, the land, comes from the Hebrew word ratzon. Aretz, ratzon, which means will. And shamaim is the goal. Indeed. To where else does one run? The Hebrew word ratz from ratzon. Do you know that the Hebrew word for will and the Hebrew word for running are connected? La roots to run, ratzon, desire, because when one desires something, when one has will, has a will to encounter something, what do you do? You run to, to it. Ratz related to aretz. If not to there, sham related to shamayim. Where else do you run if not there? All that God created was the aspiration and the goal, was the ratzon and the sham, the aspiration and the goal, the purpose and the process of reaching it. That's what God created in shamayim and aretz, the aspiration and the goal. And now let's go back. So if God creates the aspiration and the goal, so what are we to do? Our process is to move towards that goal, but, but not to take over the goal. Because if we go directly to heaven, if we build a tower and we take over heaven, what does heaven stop becoming? It stops being sham. And it starts being po. It starts being here. Heaven is supposed to be sham. It's our goal. And they said, you know what? To, to heck with goals to heaven with goals. We're going to take over here. We're going to take, take over heaven and place ourselves there. So the people that comprised the first group decided that they would be shamayim, the ultimate purpose. This group sought to take for itself the defining and clarifying aspect of speech. They wanted to take it over. It belongs to us. Shamayim, there, heaven is ours. That's group number one. Group number two, remember there are two other groups. I think we're gonna, we're gonna change the order a little bit. And the second group, or two other groups, one that wanted to wage war and then one that wanted to worship idols. One that wanted to wage war against heaven, the other wanted to worship idols in heaven. The second group said, let's go worship idols. They wanted to take over the guidance of the world that corresponds to speech as leadership, to Yad Ber, that's, that's the Hebrew connotation, the connection of Dibur to, to leadership. But they said, we want to take over the leadership. We're going to worship idols up there. This goes, there's much more to talk about in terms of idolatry. But part of a, one of the principles of idolatry is the ability of human beings to control the gods, to manipulate the gods. That if we do this, then God will do that. We'll make sure we, the gods, look to us for guidance in terms of what to do, how to run the world. And that's very different from how we, we, encounter, uh, we encounter God. So number, one, number two was the concept of leadership which leads us to the third concept, which is uh, the togetherness, the speech being something that brings people, that connects people, and waging war is the antithesis of connecting people. The third group said, let us ascend to the heavens and wage war with the creator, seeking to take for itself the entire realm of interaction and bonding, making it completely human, and to wage war, the opposite of bonding, against anything beyond the human realm. So we have the three connotations, and this will take this will take for me at least another month and a half for these teachings to actually sink in and to appreciate the depths of them. But he explored three different approaches to speech: speech as uh, speech as a way of describing and giving clothes to the reality, to the comprehension; speech as a leadership component, and speech as a unifying, as something that brings people together. And applied each one to the three different uh, groups of people who wanted to build the Migdal Bavel, the Tower of Bavel. And to close this part off, or this piece off, just want to look at the rest of the story. God came down to look at the city. This is, we're picking up where we left off. Now verse five, we read the first four verses. And now verse five, God came down to look at the city 
and tower that humanity had built. And God said, if as one people with one language for all, this is how they have begun to act, then nothing that they may propose to do will be out of their reach. And this, I've never internalized this before reading this to prepare for, for, this, for today, for this class. What God is saying here is that with one language, anything is achievable, including what they wanted to do. Meaning with the perfection of language and of communication, what human beings could have done is waged war in the heavens and won. What human beings, what God gave us the power of speech to do is to, to exist in the heavens, to make the shampo, to settle the heavens, to reach there, to do whatever we want there. We could have taken over the world, not only the world, but the heavens. We could have connected our ratzon with the sham, with the shamayim. We could have connected shamayim va'aretz, heaven and earth, through the power of communication, of language, if only we had used it properly. If only we had, we had been unified, not in this nourish kite, not in in this make work project of let's let's put some bricks together and then we'll figure out what to do with them. But if we had come together and said, how can we together make God king over all of the earth? How could we achieve our goals? How could we fulfill what God wants of us? Then anything would have been possible, God says. With one language, anything is possible. And then let us then, God says, Hava nerda v'navla sham sfatam, we're going to confound their speech. Asher lo yishmu ish svat re'ehu, so they shall not understand one another's speech. Basically, what's the punishment? The punishment is the world as we know it. The punishment is our world, in which communication is imperfect, in which we don't quite understand each other, in which one nation doesn't speak the language of another nation, in which language, and I say this in Quebec in 2022, in which language can be used to divide people in instead of bringing them closer together to achieve, achieve greatness beyond what we could have ever imagined. That's the punishment. The punishment is our world, our linguistic reality. And so that's a piece of Rav Moshe Shapiro's insights into the Tower of Bavel, into the what that this is, this is again, that this is not a story about bricks and this is not a story about a tower. This is a story about the power of language and language as a divine gift to us that can achieve our greatest ambitions and, and goals if only we use it in, in the proper way. Any, uh, any questions before part two, before I turn it over to Rabbi Fishman for questions or comments and or, com or complaints? <laughs> we'll take it all. Okay. I never noticed. Wonderful. Kolashe Yazmu Asot is a direct repetition of the language of Adim Zolomim. Hmm. There is yeah. a reference of uh, witnesses that conspire to evilly, falsely testify against somebody for nefarious purposes. And there is a paralleling of language there that what they wanted to do had a nefarious purpose. Beautiful. I did. I've never noticed that before. That's amazing. Beautiful. Thank you. Perfect. Rabbi Fishman. Okay. Thank you. Um, I did send your email a okay. source sheet. I will open because it. Because I, I prepared a few sources, and I would like to uh, like to read with you. Rabbi, could you speak a little closer to the microphone? Absolutely. How's that? Can you hear me better now? Yeah, very much so. Thank you. Okay, great. So I prepared uh, a source sheet for you, and I would like to learn with you perhaps the most famous of all verses on Parashat Noah, and that's the opening one. So let us see the opening verse on Parashat Noah. Noah is described in a way that called? nobody else, Noah, but not Abraham, that nobody else is described. And this is an incredible description. 
And I'd like you to uh, to take a look at the following. I'm going to maximize mm -hmm. the uh, window itself. Great. So do you see the first verse there? Yep. Make smaller the Ela Toldot Noach. These are the generations of Noah. We're giving a family tree. These are the descendants of Noah. Ela Toldot Noah. Noah Ish Sadik. Tamim Hayabadoratav. Noah was a Sadiq, righteous. Nobody in the entire Torah is given that appellation. That's pretty good going. That would be very nice for any of us. And this is the Torah speaking here. This isn't the newspapers. The Torah is claiming and therefore verifying with an objective sense of reality that Noah was a Sadiq. Wonderful. Tamim Hayabadoratav. He was perfect in his generation. Sounds even better. How'd you get better than a Sadiq? Tamim Hayabadoratav. He was perfect in his generation. Et Elohim Hitalech Noach. Noach walked with God. Beautiful. Beautiful. Sounds like Noah is the greatest of the greats. And that is, of course, until we take a look at Rashi. The next commentary of Rashi does something unexpected. If we were to stop there and not look at any of the commentaries, who is Noah? The greatest, the best. And indeed, there were some that felt that way. Some of our rabbis explained this verse, specifically the word Bedoratav. You see the word that is highlighted there, Bedoratav. He was perfect in his generations. So that word in his generations gave an opening for interpretation. He was righteous even in his generation. Kol shekain ilu haya bedo sadikim haya sadik yoter. Listen, if you can, what does Rudyard Kipling say? If you can keep your head while all around you are losing theirs, then you'll be a sadik, my son. Something like that. I think that was the original language. So. If you can keep your head while all around you are losing theirs, could you imagine if Noah lived in a righteous generation? Call Shekane, all the more so he would have been righteous if he had lived in an even better period of time. However, and this is a big however, Yesh Dorashim Oto Laganai. And what does that word Ganai mean? A great rabbinic word. There are some of our sages who interpret that word Doratav to his discredit. Some see that Noah was great in his generations. Well, Lafi Dora Haya Sadik. Only, and there's that key word, only in his generation was he righteous. The Ilu Haya Badoro shall Avraham Lo Nachshav Luklum. But had he lived in the generation of Abraham, he would have been a nothing. That is very harsh. Lo Haya Nachshav Luklum. By the way, I want to point out a nuance here that the Reference of Rashi is referencing us to Sanhedrin 108a. But if you look up that reference, like Rabbi Shire and I were always taught, never believe the footnotes. Look it up, look up the citations. You will not see that language anywhere in the Talmud. In fact, you will not find that language anywhere in the Midrash. All of the Midrashim 
And the Talmud says, had he lived in the generation of Avraham, he would not have been as great. Rashi is doing something on his own accord. And he says something that none of the rabbis or classic Midrashim ever state. Rashi adds those words, Lo haya nachshav l'klum. he would have been a nobody. That is Rashi's Chiddush. Amazing. What Rashi is pointing out is, it's not that Noah would have been less than Abraham. We're not talking about scales of magnitude, but rather what Rashi is pointing out is we're talking about a different order completely. Noah would not have been even able to have been compared to an Avraham because he would have been classified in a different order, absolutely. Compared to Avraham, he would have been a zero, it would have been a nothing. You wouldn't have even been able to compare him. Now that screams out to Darshani. That, that just begs for further explanation. How could it be that a person who is a Sadiq, a, a person who is Tamim Haya, he was perfect, but Duratav ends up being given such short change. He would have been considered of no importance whatsoever. And I would like to suggest, and this is taken along the lines of the Shem Mishmur commentary, a Hasidic commentator who has a commentary on Rashi, that Perhaps it was because of Noah's perfection that he is deemed to be less than mm. Avraham. Do you know how perfect Noah was? Listen to the following Midrash. This is not on the page, but I'll share with you an incredible Midrash taken from the Avot de Rebbe Natan. The Avot de Rebbe Natan says that when Noah was born, he was born circumcised. That is not making a biological comment. It's not speaking about Noah physically. It's talking about Noah spiritually. Do you want to have an insight into who Noah was? When we say he was perfect, Tamim, he was so perfect, he already had a bris milah at birth. He was born circumcised. And therein lies the limitations of perfection. Because Judaism comes along and teaches us, at least Yesh Shadorashim, those of the Midrash who want to explain it to his discredit. We have an incredible teaching. What does perfection mean? What does greatness mean? What does it mean to have really achieved something? Well, precisely that word, you've achieved it. But to be born perfect, to enter as a completed state where everything is good and everything is fine, is not to have earned what it is that you have accomplished. It's simply to be handed it on a silver platter. And so we have now a completely new definition in, in our Jewish tradition for greatness. What is greatness? What is perfection? What does it mean to be righteous? We're talking about a person's righteousness here. We're talking about a person that makes mistakes. We're talking about a person that fools. We're talking about, in other words, you and me. When we look at ourselves, not Rabbi Shaya, he's, he's perfect. But when, but, but when we look at ourselves and we, we have a self-evaluation, we might, we might think about, oh, I've made this mistake. I've made that mistake. I've made the other. Oh, I'm not a very good person. And our tradition comes on and says, it's people that fool and then get back up again, who are the greatest of people. And that's why Noah is not put on the pedestal according to our tradition, because it just came to him. It was just simple, it was just easy. I'm sure you had those friends in school. They never revised for a test, they never seemingly worked hard and they would ace all of them. 
And the teacher would look at them and say, perfect, you got another A plus. Our tradition comes along and says, it's about the person that was the D or E or F student that kept making mistakes, but got back up again and worked hard and achieved their accomplishments. Those are the greatest people of all. I want to share with you one of the most, along those lines, inspirational passages of Talmud. So interesting. You and I have an up and down scroll in opposite directions. Mm. I did that last time. Mm. This is taken from Ta'anit 25b. 25b. We know then and still to today, the land of Israel needs rain. This is something that has not changed from the ancient world to modern times. When it doesn't rain, the people are in trouble. There is a one-to-one -one correlation. It might be the startup nation. It might be the home of technology and high tech. But when it doesn't rain, the Middle East is really in trouble. Let's take a look at one such time. Tana Rabbanan. It was taught. Ma'aseh b'Rebi Eliezer. Shegaza shlosh esrei ta'aniot ala tzibor v'lo yardu gashamim. What was the classic rabbinic response to drought? Fasting. Fasting. Now, we're familiar with Yom Kippur. You fast. If you're really a knowledgeable Jew, you might be familiar with Tisha B'Av. We fast and other associated fasts. The fast of Esther, I'm sure we, we are all familiar with. But in the ancient world, fasts were actually a part of their lives on a much more common common occurrence. It was in response to the weather conditions that the leadership would actually decree upon the community fasting. And I'm not going to describe it now, but if you look at the Mishnah in Tanit, it's fascinating. It gives you the entire schedule and calendar for how you call a fast day. There's a fast day, then there's three fast days, seven fast days. Make sure you don't do it on Shabbat, do it every seven or third day. And then it goes up to 13. And if you've created 13 fast days, you're in trouble. You're, you're, the, you're, you're starving. There's a drought. Your animals have no vegetation. You're really in trouble. Rabbi Eliezer decreed 13 fasts. Nothing. No rain. No rain. And he says something dramatic. And this is very, I've got, I've got goosebumps. He says something very dramatic. But Achrona, at the end of 13 fasts, the community all leave shore, they begin to exit, and he said to them, you're exiting? Well, if that's the case, I guess you must have dug your own graves by now, because we're all dead. Amalehem. You're walking out of shul. I guess it. I guess it's for your own funeral, because we're all going to die of thirst. Ga'u kol ha'am and everyone started crying. Everyone started crying. And amazingly, what was the response to all of their cries? Biyardu geshamim. At that point, when everyone burst into tears, that. That's when the rain fell. There was no response to prayer. When was the response of the rain to people's emotional state of the rain, of crying? Another story. Shuvma seb Rebbe Eliezer, Shiarad lefnei teva. He was praying in synagogue before the ark. Ba'ama esrim va'arba brachot v'lo na'ana. He recited twenty four blessings and was not answered. 24 blessings. Could you imagine such a long Amida? 24 blessings? Nothing. Yarad, Rabbi Akiva, Acharav, Amar. Rabbi Akiva gives it a go. He walks up to the prayer lectern after Rabbi Eliezer fails. And he doesn't say 24 blessings. And he doesn't prolong his tefillah. He says very simply a one line. Avinu Malkeinu, our father, our king, Ein Lanu Melech Ela Ata. We have no 
other king other than you. If you recognize that line, if it sounds familiar, you are saying it on Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. Avinu Malkeinu, Lamancha Rachem Aleinu. For your sake, not for us, for your sake, have mercy on us. Biyardu Gashamim. And the heavens opened up. Amazing. Amazing. But there's a postscript to this story. Could you imagine if you're Rebbe Eliezer, how crestfallen you must have felt? He's beating his chest. He's crying his eyes out. He's performing the chazanut with the sense of tears and crying. Please, please, please. No going. Nothing doing. Rabbi Akiva gets up. Hashem. Avinu makenu ein lanu melech ei la'ata. Avinu makenu lamancha rachem aleinu. You're our God. Do this for your sake. Have mercy. And that's all it took. And everyone starts whispering. Do you know what it's like? Even among the sages, people can't stop sending out their Twitter responses. People can't stop turning to social media. Havoma rabbanei rabbanan. All the sages start whispering among themselves. Oi, Taka, look at that. I guess Rabbi Akiva is such an amazing... Rabbi Eliezer isn't everything he's cracked up to be. No, 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 no. A voice comes out from heaven and says, Don't think Rabbi Akiva is even greater than Rabbi Eliezer. You know why I answered Rabbi Akiva's prayers, but not Rabbi Eliezer's prayers? It's not because he's greater. He's not. Rabbi Eliezer is the greatest of the great. But in this one instance, Rabbi Akiva has one advantage. Ma'avir al midotav. What does that mean? That's a very powerful expression. Here they translate it as no, I'm not going to look at the translation. Don't look at the translation. He overcomes his measurements, is a literal translation. Ma'avir al midotav. Or he goes beyond his measurements. This one does not go beyond his measurements or his characteristics, his character traits. What do you think that means? Let me open that up to, to the class. The reason, Rabbi, Ele, Rabbi Akiva is not better, but in this one instance, he has one advantage over Rabbi Eliezer. He is ma'avir al midotav. He can go beyond his character traits. What do you think that means, anybody? Well, I just want to say something, which is a little something, but I think of the Rainmaker, the movie with Burt Lancaster. Perfect. That's, ex that's exactly this. That is exactly this. Nice, nice comment. What, what do you think that might mean? What, what is Rabbi Akiva's trait or quality in this particular instance? Anybody know? So I'll tell, I'll tell you, you can read the translation, but it's not a good translation. Here, the, the, it's usually excellent. Here, here it's not. They said that Rabbi Akiva is forgiving and Rabbi Eliezer is not forgiving. I, I don't like that. I, I don't believe that's the true essence of that expression. And we have words for forgiving. It would have said it explicitly. I think it means the following. Ma'avi al-midotav means that a person is able to overcome their tendencies. This person has an innate type of character. Maybe they have a certain type of proclivity to their expression of their personality. And Rabbi Akiva, in this one instance, is greater than Rabbi Eliezer because he was able to overcome his innate uh, nature. And for that reason, and think how beautiful this is being paralleled, God too overcame his innate nature. He did not want to give rain. He was withholding the rain because he felt that it was an appropriate punishment. But God overcame his innate nature in response to Rabbi Akiva overcoming his innate nature. Fascinating. That's one approach. There's another approach that says, 
Ma'ave al midotav, in a similar vein, but in a in a slightly nuanced direction, Ma'ave al midotav, he overcame his background. Rabbi Akiva was not born religious. Rabbi Akiva, this is a class for another day, hated religious people. Mm. In an amazing comment at the end of his life, Rabbi Akiva was reminiscing. You know, he got the the biographer to write his biography for him, and he said, "You know, when I was a little boy and I saw the rabbis, I wanted to bite them like a donkey." And the biographer interrupted him. He's like, "Oh, d- d- don't don't you mean a dog? It's a dog that bites." And he's like, "No, no, 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 no. I'm being precise. I mean a donkey because when a dog bites, it breaks a bone, but when a donkey bites it shatters the bone and that's how much i hated religious people i wanted to bite them like a donkey but that's a fascinating tangent we'll leave that for another rabbi akiva was not born religious he did not grow up in a religious family he had an animosity towards religious jews and yet he started learning the alphabet he taught himself how to read he grew he overcame he excelled and went beyond his natural innate state of how he was raised. He was Ma'avir Amidotav. And because he was able to go beyond and to conquer his nature, to overcome his tendencies, so too God was able to respond in kind and allow it to reign. Why am I sharing this Talmudic passage? This is all a part of a larger presentation by the Shem Mishmur, a very beautiful one. It's exactly the same. Why is Noah not put on a pedestal? Why is Noah of limited praise? Because he was born perfect. He did not develop. He did not grow. He did not achieve. He did not accomplish. Greatness in Judaism is not to be born circumcised. Greatness in Judaism is to go through hardship, struggle, toil, and to be able to even go against your innate proclivities to build yourself up into something True. something superior. And that is the very definition of greatness. That's how a person described as a sadiq, tamim hayabadoratav, can have a great ambivalence in the eyes of our sages towards him. And precisely for that reason, because his life was lived on the silver platter that he received from the very beginning. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. The Shem Mishmo, not me. Is Tamim also sim- simple? The definition of Tamim, something with simple. Perfect. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Say that again. I, I misheard I, you. I think the question connected to the uh, to the child on the Passover Seder, who was referred to as the Tam, mm. which is uh, simplicity, as opposed to, we, right. we associate with simplicity, as opposed to perfection. Mm. Per- exact. Exact example. Yeah. Very good. So the, uh, the, the, so the question is, how do you differentiate or how are the words differentiate? In one case, it means simplicity. And in Noah's case, it seems oh. to mean perfection. So the, um, the word perfection here is used in connection with Abraham. I think the, the word is defined with its nuance in the context in which it appears. You're absolutely right. Tam means simple, the, 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 the Ben HaTam, the simple child at the Seder. If you look at the Abraham story, in relation to his Brit Milah, God says to him, tamim. Walk before me and become perfect, become tamim. There is a, a sense of growth in Abraham's Brit Milah, specifically in that area, that indicates that what we're referring to is, don't be simple, but rather be perfect. In your struggle, in your achievements, you will reach your perfection. And that's why the nuance there of tamim for uh, Noah is actually the same word used with Abraham. I hope, I hope that answers the question. Sure. And it also, by the way, just parenthetically, leads a lot more, more the Hasidic commentators to look at the simple child in a much more holy mm-hmm. and wholesome way. Whereas we, you know, many often translate it as, as an intellectual simplicity. Um, it, it many look at that child as, as the holiest child of, of all, the one who accepts everything and, and 
has no questions. Uh, uh, not, it's not that he doesn't know how to ask questions, but, but has no questions because there's a simple simplicity to the faith that is uh, that is very pure. It's happy is simplicity, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Can I um, express a, a little bit of discomfort? Please. Uh, the idea of perfect uh, is for me not a satisfactory word because it denies any further evolution mm -hmm. and I'd rather use the word potential that you're always achieving your potential but there's never an end point and the idea that Noble was born perfect it's like saying he was born, but there was nothing much to do because he was already perfect. And uh, the whole idea of evolu evolving uh, is, is a non sequitur because he's already there. So that's why I think perfect is, is a, an unfortunate word, at least in English, whereas potential, reaching your potential seems to me to be a little bit more uh, hopeful. <laughs> hmm. I, I, I appreciate the point very much. I think that, however, that is actually the answer to the, the question. Hmm. The, 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 the starting point in the discourse was, why is there ambivalence with Noah when he is described in such glowing terms? And uh, because after all, no one else is described this way. It really is outstanding. Hmm. And yet there are There are certain voices in the rabbinic tradition that describe Noah to his discredit. And the answer, as you have articulated, is that tamim as perfect implies no further development. So that becomes the answer to this mm -hmm. conundrum. There wasn't a development of Noah's spirituality. Okay. Okay, we'll uh, we'll close with that, and we'll see everyone again next week. the uh, The source sheet for the first half of the session has been put in the chat, and it will also be available on the uh, the, the video that we'll post on YouTube in the description of the video. The source sheet will be uh, accessible there. And in the meantime, we will wish everyone a Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for joining us. I, I would like to share before you go that, and this is going to be slightly embarrassing, so he'll he'll forgive me. He'll be ma'avir amidotav. But Rabbi Shaya's presentation of Rabbi Moshe Shapiro, I found absolutely fascinating. And um, there's not many people teaching that level of Torah. So what you're getting, you might just take it for granted. Yeah, Rabbi Shaya is giving a class. It's, I, I'm among rabbis and scholars and where I happen to be living at the moment. Uh, it, it's a highly educated intellectual community. It, what you received from Rabbi Shire just now was like gold, real gold. And, and don't take it for granted because I was inspired. I Those ideas were new to me. To, so, to me too. I, I'm a conduit like, like amazing, you are. I'm passing amazing. along beautiful profound, teachings. Profound, profound oh, ideas of Moshe Shapiro. Shapiro. Yeah, very amazing. One so, thing we don't do is take anything for granted in this class. Well, we you started. Are. Thank you, Esther. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Rabbi. It's uh, refreshing to hear someone speak English for a change. <laughs> <laughs> I try. I, I, I'll try and reach a Rabbi Shaya's level next time. <laughs> Thank you. Much to all. Avir Amamidotav.